My name is Joe and I want to talk about target curves and why you may be using the incorrect one. I've used various target curves over the years from the Harman target curve, and I use air quotes for a reason, to something with a more gentle downward slope and variations of these types of curves. And what I've found is that none of them were correct for my particular room, for my speakers, etc. And let's get into why that may be the case. I've posted some polls on my YouTube channel where I asked two different questions, and here are the results. Some of my viewers already know my stance on target curves. I've talked about it various times on our podcast, as well as other videos that I've done in the past. I think the issue with the first poll that I did here was that I didn't leave an option for I don't know. I think a lot of people might have checked that. In the second one, I did leave that option and I found that a lot of people either gave an answer that I don't believe is correct or they chose I don't know. And that is somewhere around 50%. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make this video because I wanted to clarify a lot of these things. I think there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to target curves. And let's talk about some of those right now. So first let's talk about target curves and what they aim to do. A target curve is a frequency response that you expect to have from your speakers at your main listening position. A lot of people seem to think that having a frequency response measure a certain way at your listening position will give you a certain sound. And a lot of people also think that using the same target curve or the same frequency response at your listening position will give you the same experience from room to room, regardless of which speakers you use. And that is simply not true. When we talk about target curves, it's hard to not talk about the Harman research and what they came up with, which was a curve that a lot of people seem to use. They call it the Harman target curve. I've heard it referred in various ways. Uh, some people call it a preference curve, but basically what it is is Dr. Floyd Toole in his book about psychoacoustics talks about how they used a JBL M2 professional speaker in various theater situations. And the first thing to notice about some of these is that the curves are different even despite the fact that they were using the same speaker and that's because the rooms were different. But if you look at an average of all these rooms, you will see a trend where there is a bass rise and a treble roll off based on distance. And the thinking behind this is that if this JBL M2 speaker, which applies DSP and it has very good directivity, if this is how that speaker measures, then if you use that target curve, then your speakers should sound like the JBL M2 but that is definitely not the case. I've actually talked to Dr. Tool about this on the phone, and he said, I don't know why people use this as a target curve. It was never designed to be a target curve. In other words, it was descriptive in nature. It described what the JBL M2 did in these various rooms, but it wasn't prescriptive, meaning that it wasn't meant to tell you how to EQ your system. Now to understand why this is the case, I need to talk about a few technical terms. I'm not gonna get into all of them right now. I wanna keep this video as simple as possible. So just know that I'm kind of skimming over the top of this. But the two things I wanna talk about are directivity and something called the transition region. So first of all, directivity. I've made a video in the past about directivity. You can watch it up here. And I talk about what directivity is and why speakers with bad directivity don't take well to EQ. The basic idea though is that there is an on-axis sound that you get from a speaker that comes directly towards you and then there is an off-axis response going to the sides, hitting the side walls, reflecting, and then that sound also gets to your ears. In a room, depending on how far you are, you will get a combination of that direct sound and the reflected sound. Now if you have a great speaker with great directivity, the on-axis sound and the off-axis sound will be more similar than different. But maybe a speaker with a poor enclosure design or a bad crossover network, you will get directivity mismatches where the on-axis sound and the off-axis sound are not similar. In which case when you try to EQ one, try to EQ on-axis, it messes up the off-axis and vice versa. If you try to EQ off-axis, it messes up your on-axis. If you've ever seen Spinorama data of a speaker, you'll see the on-axis response. And then you'll also see sound power, early reflections, and various measurements around the speaker. When you look at the difference between the sound around the speaker, 
versus the on-axis direct sound with the microphone pointed directly at the speaker, you will see that there is a difference between those two and that difference is what we consider the directivity index. And various speakers will have different directivity. This is important because if you have a speaker with good directivity, then it's EQable because the on-axis and off-axis are similar. If you don't, then you cannot EQ that speaker the same exact way as the other speaker. The next concept is about the transition region and some people refer to this as the Schroeder frequency. I'm not sure that that's the correct term in our home theaters. I think it may be more for larger spaces, but just for the sake of this, just know that people are kind of referring to the same thing. Basically what happens is that sound differs based on whether you're close to the speaker versus if you're far from the speaker. So if you're closer to the speaker, you're getting more of that direct sound. Anything that's happening off axis, it, you may hear some of that, but it's not until it hits sidewalls and, and nearby surfaces where it really starts to compound and gather up and you'll hear more of that off axis sound than even the direct sound, depending on how far you are from the speaker. So if you're close to the speaker, you're within what they call the critical distance and you're in the near field of that speaker. I mentioned critical distance and that is the point where the sound from the far field when you are further from the speaker and you're getting more of the reflections from the sidewalls is greater than the on axis sound, the direct sound. So there's a point where those two are equal. The way you can also think about this is that all the frequencies don't react the same way. So the bass frequencies typically in a room are dominated by the room. The room interacts with the subwoofer because the waves are so long that you can't really separate them out. But with the higher frequencies, our brains are able to differentiate the sound coming directly from the speaker, as well as the reflections, depending on how late those reflections come in. So keep that in mind, higher frequencies and lower frequencies are different in the way that they interact with the room itself. The reason why it's important to understand the transition region is because as you get further away from the speaker, the higher frequencies tend to start to roll off based on the distance. And so there's something called air attenuation, but there's also a factor of how reflective the room is. So depending on the room size, there is a point in the frequency response where the higher frequencies start to act very different from the mid range and the lower frequencies. And that is what we're considering the transition region. Now, because we're able to differentiate between what's coming at us on axis versus off axis versus the base where we really can't tell the difference between the two, they're inseparable. That means that below the transition region, which is room dependent and frequency dependent based on the size of the room, how far you are from the speakers, etc. Because the lower frequencies react differently from the mid range, higher frequencies, that means that they need to be EQ'd in different ways. So now that you know the two concepts of directivity and the transition region, now you'll start to understand why a generic target curve, whatever it may be, cannot be correct for every single room. And that is because we have different speakers with different directivity. We also have different rooms where that transition region and the critical distance is different based on the room, how reflective it is, whether you have sound treatment up, how far you are from the speakers, all these things are factors that determine what target curve or correction curve that you will apply to achieve a certain target curve. The reason I mentioned correction curves is because we have to apply a correction to the speakers in order to achieve some sort of target curve. Now the correction needs to be based on these things that we talked about. We need to take into account directivity. We also need to take account the transition region and how we apply EQ to the upper frequencies versus the lower frequencies. So by using a single target curve, whatever it may be, you can see the downsides that it doesn't take into account your speakers, your room, your listening distance. And so you will get a suboptimal correction for your particular system. So we've talked about target curves, what they're used for. We've also talked about the two polls that I posted on my channel, the first one, being whether using the same EQ on various systems would sound the same? And the answer is definitely no. Using the same exact EQ based on a measurement at the listening position will not sound the same because we don't know what the speakers are. We don't know the directivity. We have no idea how the room is interacting with the speaker and changing the transition region of the speaker. And so 
there's no way to properly EQ a speaker without all of that information. The second question was whether flat at the main listening position would give you an accurate neutral response. And the answer to that is also no, because flat at your main listening position doesn't have the characteristics of a typical room where you may have a bass rise, you have a high frequency roll off. So by making it flat there, it actually makes it sound more unnatural and less accurate. And so I'll get into that in part two of the video, which I will post very soon. We'll, we'll, we'll get into more detail about various types of target curves and we'll apply them to the speakers to show you what it actually does to the speakers and why it doesn't sound good. We also talked about why using a one size fits all generic target curve is not gonna work in every single situation. You may get lucky and for some reason it happens to fit your room response perfectly. And uh, yeah, maybe if you have a JBL M2 professional speaker, that might work. And also if you're in one of those theaters that they measured. So I do plan on talking about this in more detail when I discuss my Magic Beans app and how we take near field measurements, main listening position measurements, look at the difference to determine how the room is interacting with the speakers to provide the best possible target curve for your system. So look out for part two of this video. I'm gonna be showing why near field measurements in room are important, even compared to some anechoic measurements and basically go into more detail about this particular topic. So that's it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. And if you like the video, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all those things, and maybe watch some of these other videos that are related up here.